things into Samaria. So the history of Samaria is a great mixture. And you find under the Assyrian rule, there were people that were brought in from different places, and they brought in a sense of great mixture. So when Jesus is, is talking about going through Samaria, he's talking about going through a region that is highly affected by the spirit of the age. And so when you come into the church today, you find the same kind of scenario where you have a Samaritan crowd. Crowd that is highly mixed. When I say mixed, we're not talking about racial integration. We are talking about mixed in, the, in terms of the world and in terms of the commands of God. There's a mixture between what is happening in the world. And you know, the Bible clearly instructs us that there should be no mixture. The mixing of seed, the mixing of an oxen, and a donkey that should be plowing together the mixture of garments in terms of uh, wool and, <clears throat> and linen should be uh, put on the same garment. So when we talk about mixture, and we have a lesson which is lesson 21 in the ABC curriculum, which deals primarily with the, with the issue of the Samaritan. But when Jesus comes in, he positions himself at a well. And uh, I want you to know wherever there's a well, there's a lady. Anyone, any single men here? <laughs> you got to find a well. Wherever there's a well, you're going to find a Rebecca. Amen? You'll always find a lady at the well. And so, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus is at this well. Jesus is at this well. Now, the location of the well is within the region of a place called Shechem. You will find that uh, Jesus is sitting at a well which Jacob gave to Joseph as an inheritance. Jacob, the father, gave Joseph, his son, this well as an inheritance. So I want you to know, a well is established, and please note that I'm just condensing all of these things because of time. A well is established on the basis of a father-son principle. That the well is built on the foundations of Jacob giving his son Joseph an inheritance and it is called Shechem. So, when this well is established, Jesus is sitting at this well because he is thirsty and he is tired from his journey. And so this woman comes in the middle of the day. You know that she comes at 12 o'clock in the day. She comes at midday primarily because she is embarrassed because she has had five husbands and the husband that she currently has now is not her husband. And obviously if she goes to the well when all the other women are there, they will beat her up because she's probably, they are probably afraid that, that she will take their husband. So she decides to go when she is all alone. And obviously because of that kind of stigma that is attached to her, she goes in the heat of the day. No one goes to collect water at 12 o'clock because it will evaporate by the time you go home. Because it is so hot. But she goes at this time and Jesus is sitting at this well. And he asks her a very, he asks her a very simple question. He says, please may I have a drink of water. Is that correct? And when he asked her for a drink of water, this is what she replied. She replied to him, how can you, a Jew, being, uh, ask me, a Samaritan, ask me for a drink of water? How many of you know simple things become highly complicated in the spirit of the age? Now, all she asked for was a drink of water. All he asked for, rather, was a drink of water. But she made it a political scenario. She made it a racial issue. <laughs> Come on. That's what the spirit of the age does. You make very simple things highly complicated. That's why I'm saying to you when we say father, we have to say blacksmith. Because people don't understand. That's why he goes to very intricate details to explain things. Because as a medical doctor, he can diagnose stupidity. And he knows what to prescribe. <laughs> I've been listening for years. And I know it. He knows that he has to give very, very specific details. Because people take basic things and make it highly complicated. And that's what the spirit of the age will do. It can take things that are very simple and make it so complicated. Now, that's not to demean what we do. Hello? 
That does not mean that what we do is very simple. <laughs> but I want you to understand that when you're functioning within a specific time period, you got people that are thinking in a specific way. People that are listening to us think racially. They think with a, with a, with a segregated mind. They think with a mind of always being oppressed. They think with a mind of racial prejudice. They think with a mind of poverty. Come on, help me now. They have a way of thinking. And it comes because of the spirit of the age. And they are in your, in your, uh, in your, in your range of influence. And as you are continually speaking to them, you understand that what is simple can become highly complicated. And you can go through all the questions that the Samaritan woman responded to Jesus. And you'll find how complicated she made what is really simple about. But it's the spirit of the age. But Jesus is sitting at this well. And I want you to know that if you want to deal with the spirit of the age, you as a shepherd have to also be with other shepherds and wise men at the well. But because when the, the well is opened, only when all the flocks are there. When, <clears throat> when, uh, when Jacob were, was, went to the well, and you know that all the shepherds were coming to the well, and he went to open the, the well for, for the flocks of Rachel and, and Leah, or Rachel at that time. The shepherd said to him, you're not allowed to open this well until all the flocks are there. So do you know there is a well where all there is can be a representation of shepherds within a city, where all the flocks can be present. There's certain things God releases only when all the flocks are there. There's an unfolding of certain deep things only when all the flocks are there. Listen, Simeon is only released from prison only when all the brothers are there. And the word Simeon come, means intelligent hearing. It is the Greek word Simon, and it simply means to hear intelligently. There's a level of hearing that is locked. It is in prison until Benjamin is there. Amen. Until all 12 brothers are together. There's an unfolding of a hearing, a capacity to hear God. That is why you can lock yourself off, you can fast, you can go to the mountain, you can be a monk and God won't speak to you. You can take a Sabbath for one year, God won't talk to you. Until you come to this place where there's a well, where there's a... Sh gathering of shepherds and wise men where God will unlock deep things. How many of you know a well you have to dig? And in the construction of a well, you're going to have Essek. That's called strife. You're going to have Sitna, contention. And then you'll have a place where God will make room. That's called Rehoboth. But you've got to keep digging. There are things we make. There are things we build. And there are things we dig. I want you to know, man is made. The ark of Noah was made. The tabernacle of Moses was made. Go and read the words. God said, make me an ark. He never said, build me an ark. God said, make me a sanctuary. He never said, build me a sanctuary. What we make is temporary. What we build is eternal. Generations are deeply connected to the word build. You don't make generations. You build generations because you are building eternally. That's why a woman is built, mankind is made. You can read Genesis chapter 1, 26. God, man is made in the image. Is that right? Let us make man in our image and likeness. But when woman was made, the word made there, when the rib was taken out of man, the Bible says, and God made woman. The word made there is the word build. He built woman. Out of man. Come on, all our problems about women. <laughs> that means you, God builds his church out of mankind. You get it? He builds his church out of mankind. If you're making church, then you're using mankind tools to make church. But when you're building church, you pull it out of mankind's thinking. You pull it out of humankind's thinking. And you build it. 
So when you talk about digging a well, understand that you, you're going to face different frustrations. And I know here in Cape Town there have been many contentions with regards to different wells that have been dug over the period of time. But as, I, as we have been coming for so many years, we, saw some, we see so much of maturity that have come upon the brothers in terms of how the wells are being built and knowing what God is doing and those that have been assigned to come to those wells. Everyone say Amen. amen. And it's so wonderful to see all these brothers coming together. Isn't it so wonderful? Come on, give them a, a big round of applause. These are wells that have to be established where shepherds and wise men have to gather. These are very long topics which can be processed for long periods of time. But please understand that Joseph and Mary were surrounded by wise men and shepherds. Now, in Luke 2 verse 22 to 23, the Bible says, Now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. You see, Jesus said, as he prayed to the Father in John 17, he said, these are the ones, Lord, you have given to me. I have given them your word. I have given them your name. Is that correct? These are the ones you have given to me. You must believe that those that have come to you have come because God has sent them to you. And when God has sent them to you, you must present them to the Lord. Amen? You have been only given the right to give oversight over their lives. Now, when you live in the time of the spirit of the age, I want you to know one of the things that you choose to do is to control another. To exercise dominion over another. And God has never wanted us to exercise dominion over another human but we must be able to take those that God has assigned to us and present them to the law. That means you deem the right to win them. Hello? This is what Anna did. This is what Anna did. She redeemed the right to win Samuel. And when Samuel was weaned, she presented him to the Lord. That means she released him. There's a process of redeeming, weaning, and releasing. So in your own journey, if you're going to raise a generation that can overcome the spirit of the age, you can't do it. Hello? In your own individual capacity, you cannot do it. That is why God gives you grace. And that is why you have to present him to the one who is full of grace and truth. That's why all of your sons or those of you that know what about and how there's a transition into from membership to sonship and the building processes that God is establishing on the earth. Now, you have to present them to the Lord and tell them from the time that they join you that they are free. Because it is only in freedom that you actually discover covenant. Just ask the prodigal son. It is only when someone is given freedom that you discover where the bread is. And you discover who, is, who has the authority over your life. Because the prodigal son said this. He said, I have sinned against heaven. And against you. That means I sinned more importantly against what you represent. And that which has oversight over you as the one that has oversight over me. Are we together? He comes to that understanding and realizes that the food in his father's house, the servants are eating better food than he is eating. So, please know that the grace that he was desiring was the food. Amen? The grace that he was desiring was in the food. You see, when you, when you release and present people to the Lord, and you know that the Lord is... The, oh, God is the father of their spirits. Amen. Amen. He's the father of the spirit. You have been given oversight over their souls. That is why they take a yoke, so that they can find rest for their souls. Because their souls are plagued with the ruler of this age. Their soul is plagued with what is happening in this world. Their soul is plagued with the depressive nature of this world, with the competition in this world, with the image of this world, and everything that this world carries. That's the battle they're fighting. 
And that's what you have been given oversight over. That's why present them to the Lord. Hello? Rather give them away before they run away. Or rather give them away before they leave you. So that when they leave you, you won't suffer for many weeks. You'll suffer for 24 hours. Because you already presented them to the Lord. Amen? This is what Mary and Joseph did to raise Jesus in Galilee. Present him to the Lord. Amen? They went and they presented him to the Lord. The Bible says they fulfill the law. Every male, male who opens a womb shall be called holy to the law. Now, in Luke 2, 25 to 27, something very important they did. The Bible will tell you, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit to the temple. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law. Verse 36 and 39. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phineul, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years and did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings, prayers, night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Israel. Now, Jesus was brought into a corporate environment. It was called the temple. In the temple, there were two prophets. Come on now, here's the two pipes. One is called Anna, the other one is called Simeon. These two people that are waiting with great expectation, with fastings and prayer, uh, are waiting and had received, been drawn by the Spirit of the Lord. They are in this environment which Jesus is brought into. I want you to understand, if you're going to raise a people that can overcome the spirit of this age in this particular generation, they need an impartation of prophetic grace. And prophetic grace, that would give such an impartation into their lives that would cause them to overcome this world. And this is the kind of environment that Jesus is brought into. A prophetic environment. A prophetic womb. A place where there is impartations. Because you need someone to prophesy over you so that you can become the king of Israel. Like Samuel prophesied over David. You need someone to prophesy over you so that you will become Jehu. This is Elisha prophesying over Jehu. You need someone to prophesy over you so that there will be a change from Shebna to Eliakim. You need an Isaiah to prophesy over your life. Let me tell you something, the prophetic must align itself with the apostolic and you've got to craft an environment of great, a great impartation where words are declared over the lives of people. Where there's impartation of grace that comes through the declaration of God's word. Come on, somebody say amen. You need to craft such environment. You need to declare words of life over them. You need to teach them how to combat the wiles of this world. You need to be able to impart into them, into them the life of God so that they will fulfill their destinies and fulfill their purposes in God. Say amen. amen. Watchman Nee asked the question, what are you saved from? Amen. Ravi Zacharias, a popular poet, to have an exuberant time just clapping our hands and jumping around and going back home and there's no water. And going back home and we're still having domestic issues. Going back home and our bodies are plagued with sickness. Going back home and we have no electricity. Going back home and we have a whole lot of debt. No, we are saved from one system into another system. Amen? And when we are saved from one system into another system, we need to understand that God in this system, He does something through the prophetic word. It's called the Daba of God. It's called the Rima of God. That when it comes through an impartation of prophetic utterances over your life, it pushes you into something. Amen? 
There's something that pushes you into your destiny. Something that ushers you in. And you've got to know that you have to be in such environments. In such environments. That's why you say amen. Because you want, you're saying, be it unto me, Lord, according to the word. You're receiving something into your spirit man. That means your spirit man is getting stacked up with grain. You're filling your sack up. Because you are ready to receive a prophetic impartation. If we do not, if we deny that, or if we allow that to continue to take place, you're going to have a dead bunch of people around you. Say amen. amen. Can't lift their hands, can't sing, can't pray, can't do anything because they have no prophetic impartation into their lives. Something that just transforms them, shifts them, moves them, builds them, shifts them into their purpose. Just one word from the law. And that's because there's a corporate environment where there are prophetic words declared. Things that will just move you. Things that will just shift you. You gotta, you gotta craft that kind of environment. Amen? You gotta speak the word over the people of God. That's why when the word of God is read as an invocation, it's not to kill time. The word of God is read as an invocation over your life to release something to you. Amen? It crafts a prophetic environment. You see, much of what we call prophecy is a word of knowledge. Say amen. amen. What, what we call prophecy is not prophecy. It's a word of, it's a word of knowledge. But prophetic environment is where there's a great exegesis of God line by line spoken over you. That is why when Ezra the scribe stood up and read the scriptures from morning to day, the people wept. Because the word was being released to them that brought such an impartation into their life that they were convicted. When the word of God is spoken, it brings you to repentance. Amen? Because it's sharp, it's powerful, it's quick. It can do something you and I cannot do. It can bring such change to the lives of people. That people that are overcome with the spirit of this age, there can be a change in their lives when the word is declared over their lives. Spoken over them. So, Jesus was brought into an an impact. a position of corporate impartation where the prophetic word was being released. I have many things to say about this, but time will not, not allow me to do that. Now, in Luke 2, verse 39 to 40, the Bible says, When they had performed all things according to the law of the law, they returned to Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. And this is what happened. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Amen? What are you seeing here is when Mary and Joseph did all those things, hmm? when they were obedient, when they registered themselves, when they were in the company of shepherds and wise men, when they were around the well, when they, <clears throat> when they brought Jesus into a corporate environment which was the temple where there was a prophetic declaration over his life. The Bible says the child grew and became strong in spirit and filled with wisdom and the grace was of God was upon him. How many of you know they returned to Galilee? Amen? They returned to Galilee but Jesus was growing in spirit. He was growing in wisdom. And the grace of God was upon him. Simply because his parents were doing something. Amen. The corporate son that you are giving oversight to also has to grow in wisdom. Also has to grow in spirit. And we have to see the grace of God upon their lives. And we have to, we can only see that when we, when we find ourselves doing the things that Mary and Joseph did. Now, In Luke 2 verse 41, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of Passover. Everyone say every year. year. How many of you know there was consistency? Consistency. 
His parents went to Jerusalem every year. This is consistency in a corporate environment. That means his parents went to the forum every week. Let me read it like that. His parents were present at the table every week. Or once a month if you have it. His parents were present at the apostolic perspectives. Or perspectives of the apostolic, sorry. POA, correct? Whenever it was out. They were there. Okay? These are not meetings you can miss because there's something being transmitted to you to help you to deal with the spirit of the age. The certain truths that God would release in that environment that would empower you to handle the spirit of this age, to deal with the principalities rule that the sons of this world will be throwing at the people that you have oversight over. But God will release certain truths to you in that kind of environment and you're only going to get it because you are consistent. Now, here's something you've got to think about. Luke 2.42. The Bible says, When he was 12 years old, they went to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days they had returned, the boy lingered behind in Jerusalem and Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in their company, they went a day's journey And sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. Now, if your child is missing for one hour, it's a crisis. Amen? It's a crisis. Yeah, Jesus is missing for one day. One whole day. And I want you to know that Mary and Joseph were not moved by the fact that he was not with them for one day. Because the Bible says... Joseph and his mother did not know it, but supposing him to have been in the company. Everyone say, in the company. That means they were not afraid. They were not overtaken with anxiety because they knew that he was in a safe environment. Say amen. So they were not over anxious that he was missing. I want you to know, when the spirit of this age is creating of environment, an environment of terror, an environment of criminal activity, of an environment of great fear, an environment of great doubt, of an, an environment of economic crisis. When it's crafting that environment, you have a duty to craft an environment of safety. That safety is the family of God. That they would not be over anxious. That you would not be over anxious. Because you know that something that you built is safe. That when they are in that company with you, that there's no tension, that they are not afraid of slander, that no one is worried about what dress you are last week and what color clothing you're wearing this week and how was your hairstyle last week and how it is this week and what car you are driving and where you are going to and what you are doing and what are your career opportunities, etc., etc. Because the spirit of the age drives that drives that. So you you live in a realm of enviousness, jealousy, competition. And the church has been plagued with those kind of menial, childish ways for years that has brought divisions. People have left church not because of doctrine, because they were upset with someone in the church that didn't come to the birthday party. (laughs) What a fool. These are the kinds of menial things we are dealing with. But you have a duty if you want people to overcome the spirit of this age to craft a safe environment. And family is a safe place because God sets his solitary in families. The word solitary means the beloved. That's why you feel safe in such an environment. You don't have to hide your iPad and duck your iPhone. (laughs) Do all that kind of stuff. Although now you still have to do it in this kind of environment because you don't know who's here. (laughs) But you've got to craft a family household environment where people just don't want to leave. So safe. Your children feel safe. Your family feels safe. When you see your wife talking to someone else, you feel safe. You're not so anxious about it. Amen? You don't send out a search party. Check out now. Where's your wife? You don't have a security system on your wife where you can track her where she is. 
My wife doesn't know that when I'm overseas, I can track her wherever she is. It's called, it's called my phone. And just track anywhere I know where the car is. But that's also easy because it shows up on my bank account. <laughs> easy to track. But we need environments that are safe. Amen? Amen. Amen. Church must be a place of safety. You feel so secure. You feel like someone has got your back. Someone is, is looking out for you. Someone is watching over you. Someone is looking over your children. Someone is watching over them. Someone is caring for them. But we can't keep crafting environments of competition, of uh, people vying for positions on the stage, wanting to be the singers, wanting to be in the praise and worship team. That's why you've got to have certain rules. For instance, if the people do not attend the ABC class, they cannot be in the worship team. How's that for a rule? Yeah? You've got to have those kind of rules. You've got to have certain standards. I had a professional musician in my church. Professional musician. He's got a double doctorate in music. If I mention his name, you might know him. And when he came into our church, he sat down for three years. He never picked up a guitar. For three years. He used to play guitar eight hours a day. He's a jazz musician, professional jazz musician. He's now a professor of music. And when he came into our environment, he's now living in Johannesburg. When he came into our environment for three years, he never touched the instrument in our church. By the way, we only have one instrument. I forgot to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't even have an opportunity to play. <laughs> but you know what he said to me? He said to me, and this was after two years of being with us. He said to me, you are the first person that has never abused me for my gift. That's what he said to me. He said, I feel so safe being here knowing that I'm not here because someone wants me to play the guitar. Amen? Don't craft environments, environments where people feel used just because they have a skill. They may have a skill, but they won't have the word in them. They're going to transmit something from your stage. You can be careful that you're crafting the right environments. Listen, what I'm saying is very basic. What I'm saying is, is very simple. But what I'm saying works. That's the one thing I can get into you. It works. You must build such environments. You've got to take time to build such environments. You've got to build something where you know the state of your flock. The word state there is the word penim, it's the word face. It means you've got to know the face of your flock. You've got to build face-to-face -face relationships with your flock. Building that face-to-face -face relationships determines the safety of the environment. And in that safe environment where you build face-to-face -face relationships, you'll know who carries the face of a lion and who carries the face of an ox and who carries the face... <clears throat> of an eagle and who carries the face of a man because you're building face-to-face -face relationships that is why when when uh, Jacob saw his brother Esau he said I have seen your face is it is as if I have seen the face of the Lord and in that kind of safe environment when people see each other they can understand what face this person is what does he represent this is something the Lord spoke to us about last year even in our own journey the Lord really dealt with my heart about building face-to-face -face relationships. It's something that, that I carry very close. I'm a highly relational person. I have relationships for many, many years because I love to build face-to-face. -face. That is why if you WhatsApp me, my reply to you is very short because I will prefer, well, I will prefer to see your face because we want to build a safe environment. People hide in the cyber world. People find it easy to hide with SMSs and WhatsApp and all of those kind of stuff. But in a safe environment, man, I want to see your face. I want to look you in the eye. Amen? I want Elisha to lie on me. Hand to hand, mouth to mouth, face to face. I want Paul to lie on Eutychus. Hand to hand, mouth to mouth, face to face. That's the kind of environment you want. You want a safe environment. You want to build...
people that can overcome the spirit of this age is going to be done with relationships. Relationships where you can build face-to-face relationships. I feel the Lord is emphasizing this right now. That that's something you, you got to build. We can't just be always just be speaking to people. And I know that the word of grace is what covers you. But I feel that sometimes when I sit to people, there's something that happens to them that gets imparted into their lives. And like Dr. Segi said, you can't do that with everyone. It's not possible. But there are those that are your pipes. And how many of you know the pipes need servicing? Amen. They've got a lot of blockages sometimes. When the oil is flowing. And you've got to be able to spend time face to face with them. Building a safe environment. Everyone say safe environment. Safe environment. We've got to craft that. How many of you know that, that Cape Town is a place that is regarded as, certain in areas are regarded as totally unsafe. Gangsterism. So many things that is plaguing this city. But I declare in the name of Jesus, there's a people that are going to craft a safe environment. Church is not going to be a battleground anymore. It's going to be a place where the family of God is going to gather. They're going to be so rejoicing, so excited to be there, so happy to be there. That people are going to have long relationships with you. That they're not going to leave you. They're going to grow old with you. They're going to celebrate your birthdays. And you're going to dedicate their grandchildren. And you're going to be blessed when you are around them. Simply because of a safe environment. Amen. Not one way you have to project your image. And one way you have to show them how good you are. And where you, where you have to watch your P's and your Q's. Although that's very important. Because sometimes as a pastor you feel like swearing people. But... You gotta be, you gotta make sure that your environment is so safe where there's great transparency, great clarity, uh, great clarity about. That's why uh, in the relationships that you build, there must be clarity. There must not be ambiguity about where people stand with you. Lots of people, they're not clear about where they are with you. One day they're your son, one day they're not your son. We don't know where they are. There must be clarity. In terms of where you stand. Amen? You must be clear. Because if you want to craft a safe environment, you need people that are clear about what they, where they are going to be with you. Are they really going to stand with you? Are they really going to lift up your hands? Or are they just there for the ride? Are they just enjoying the biscuits and the tea and the samosa you give them after church? Or are they, are they there for the long haul? Even though they will enjoy all those benefits. But at some time, come on now. At some time, you have to stop being a parasite. You have to start being mutually beneficial to the environment that you are in. This is a safe environment. Come on, Holy Spirit. This is a safe environment. We need to craft that kind of environment. Where people don't feel intimidated, don't feel obligated, don't feel like they are left out, but they are so drawn by the love of God. This is not a seeker-friendly church. Hello, don't get me wrong. (laughs) This is not the seeker-friendly church. This is a church that is highly covenantal. They understand the demands of covenant. And it can take just 30 people to do the work of a thousand people. But you build a safe environment. You craft something that's so family-orientated. I tell you what, you can touch nations all over the world. Because God will always reduce you to 300. Because he doesn't want you to think you can do it in your own strength. He wants you to know that it is his grace that works in the 300. That is able to finish the job. We need that kind of safety. Amen. The place where, where if Jesus is missing for a couple of days, you know he's okay. <laughs> now, as I wind down. I don't know where the time has gone to. Luke chapter 2 verse 48. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Actually, the word business there is added. It should be, don't you know that I must be about my father's? So actually the business of Jesus was his father. It was simply to represent his father. 
The Bible says, but they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. But you know, the Bible says, Mary kept it in her heart. Is that right? I want you to know that when you are building a people within a specific age of time, there's one thing that you've got to do. You have to keep the end in mind. You must keep the end in mind. The end of a thing is better than its beginning. This is what we would refer to as the teleos or the finish. What is the end? The end is that as you are developing people within the spirit of the age and you are crafting them and you are developing them and you're doing all these things that we spoke about, you must know what the end is in mind. What is the goal of what you are doing? What is what you want to, what is the thing that you hope to achieve? And the thing that we hope to achieve is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That you want to teach people how to abide in him. Amen? How to abide in his word. Because if they're going to become fruitful, moving from fruit to more fruit to much fruit, they have to abide in me, they have to abide in my word, and they have to abide in my love. So there has to be an end goal in terms of how you are developing them to stay in the place of abiding. The word abide is the word meno. It means to stay in place, in time, and in state. To stay in the same place, in time, and in state. That means they must stay in the substance of who Jesus is. They must stay in the time or the kairos that he releases to us right now. Are we together? They must stay in the place. And where is Jesus? He is wherever his body is. So staying in that place of abiding in me, abiding in my word, abiding in my love, that you've got to teach people how to remain in him. Because when they are in him, they are out of this world. When they are in him, they can overcome the spirit of this age. When they learn how to abide, dwell, rely, trust, hold on to him. Because you will fail. Amen? Because you will fail. But he will not fail. And your end goal is to make sure that they are a people that are holding on to him. Abiding in Him, dwelling, relying on Him, trusting in Him. You see, you can trust in the principles, or you can trust in the one who is the principle. Principles change, but He does. Amen? Principles will change, but He does not change. And many times we find people that become reliant. And have our being in. I got three minutes, and I would like us to stand. There's also a submissive culture. You find that Jesus lived in a very submissive culture, which we don't have time this evening to get into. But I just want to, I just want to pray. I feel the Holy Spirit is imparting something to us tonight. And wherever you are, just lift your hands. Maybe you've come from an environment that is so terror orientated. Maybe right now, even as you leave this meeting, you might have to go to a house that is filled with so much of terror. But I declare to you tonight, as you stand here, the grace of the Lord is releasing peace into your life to let you know that there is a safe place. Father, we lift our hands as servants of the Most High God born servants to your word. Lord, people that want to hear your voice and do what you say. <clears throat> and today, in the name of Jesus, we receive the grace to craft environments of safety. A place, Lord, where people will come in and know that despite the rule of this age having so much of influence over their lives, but they walk into an environment of face-to-face relationships. A place, Lord, where they know that God is their refuge. He is their present help. And right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, right over this environment here in Cape Town, 
We declare, Lord, even though there's so much of violence and crime, criminal activity and gangsterism, but in the spirit today, we declare there's a company of people rising up to build a safe environment, a safe place. If that's you tonight, just begin to worship the Lord for a few moments. Just begin to call on Him, begin to pray, begin to pray that you would find yourself at a well, that you will receive grace to build a people that can overcome the spirit.